Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights. I want to thank my sponsors, Top Spinini, Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Huggins and Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, ComC.com, and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication. So here's uh, an episode for your listening enjoyment. I actually collect earliest cards. I don't call them rookie cards. I make a distinction of the first minor league card. It's the earliest pre-rookie card. It's uh, legitimately issued usually not pack pulled in most cases, but it's an early card of somebody that was in most cases in those days was unknown. They, they nearly touted as much as these, the baseball America touting of the next wave of going to be the greatest in the old days. It, it was more modest in the touting of these young players that, that reaching stratospheric pricing before they've really done anything in the big leagues. My thesis is a rookie card can be smaller than two and five eighths by three and three quarter, but it can't be bigger. And it mm. has to be rectangular. It has to have four corners. What do you think? <laughs> Let's take 1975 minis. I look at those as true rookie cards. I really do. They are just because of the size. I'm giving smaller cards a pass, but I'm drawing yeah. a line at bigger cards. If they were double size, which Pacific has done some things like that. To me, if it's a postcard size, that's why the, the Lou Gehrig is a little bit problematic. It's one of the very, very few kind of recognized now accepted rookie cards that's exhibit and, and is postcard size. Other than that, there are very few other things where the card didn't standard size or smaller. That allows all the T206s and T205s and the caramel cards and all that. They could be rookies because they're smaller. But like I said, exhibits used to be the example. Exhibits got no esteem back in the old days. And they're interesting to collect, but nobody thought those are really, they weren't very expensive. And I don't think they do today with the exception of a few YouTubers <laughs> making a big push for them. But the Gretzky rookie with the Sportscaster card. Have you seen that? It's rounded corners. Maybe it's five by eight or something. That's been speculated on. And there's one, it's, maybe it's Magic and Bird, maybe have a card there because that's 78. 78 or 70. You have box toppers in today's modern day product that comes in a pack comes on top of the packs right and it could be a parallel of his base set rookie it's licensed it meets all the requirements except for the size it's bigger i i to me i'm okay with that being a rookie card no i'm i'm saying it's not five star it's four star okay star that if you were gonna have something in your collection even though it's more difficult to find a way less distribution because it's only a box topper and it's a cool collectible but the whole idea of the rookie card is it ought to be available to the average guy it should right. be you had to buy a box. You could get it in a pack. You couldn't get the box topper in a pack. I, I have a fairness quotient that I tried to apply back in the day. I'm wondering for you, and that is that if you had a an expert version of your book and then a more novice version of your book, where the novice version of your book could be more like an extended article that you could get published in the PSA magazine and in Beckett and uh, SCD. It's like how I got started. Just get the word out, but it's a shorter version that's publishable that has the high points that helps the, the more novice collector to say, hey, if you don't do anything else, just read this three pages and you'll get a pretty good idea of what's going on. And then go to Victor's website for more info or get the whole book. But here are the principles he's trying to establish and they are reasonable. How are you handling Cards that are very well accepted as rookie cards, even though they're not. It's erroneous, but it's like grandfathered in. For example... Let me give you a new theory, because I haven't heard somebody say this exactly. But what if somebody nowadays, Panini has all basketball and all football for a little bit long, but they have for a while. And Topps has had all baseball and Fanatics now. They're going to be the sole licensee. If you go back in the history, there were people that only collected a single company. Nowadays, that's going to be the norm because there's only going to be one company producing cards and they'll have sub brands. But if you thought, you know what, in my neighborhood, I, I rarely saw any Bowman's. There were tops and this is in the mid fifties and Bowman was gone after a while. But if I say I'm only going to collect tops cards, then how is not a 52 tops Mickey Mantle, not his rookie? Because I have, I have no consideration for Bowman or anything else. I only collect tops cards. They're the flagship, the primary predominant company that makes cards. And that is his first card of Tops. It makes it a Tops rookie card. And I put an FTC on it for a long time, first Tops card. But they're basically saying that Bowman doesn't count in a way. Why? Because we only collect Tops. In the old days, 
most people collected everything, but there are a lot of people that only collect tops. There's still people now that only get the flagship and they'll get a complete factory set and put it away. And I'm done. I've got all the rookies. I've got all the players in that set. And so to that person, because I want to criticize people and say, hey, 52 tops, it's really not his rookie. He had a Bowman. Yeah. In his neighborhood. And they didn't have those packs. 52 tops was the first appearance in many neighborhoods of Mickey Mantle. And the Bowmans were distributed different the same way. Right? Yeah, they were, but they weren't everywhere. There were a lot of uh, candy stores and things that took one, but not the other. It didn't necessarily yeah. side by side. That, that's all I'm saying. I've never thought of that argument that if you lived in a Topps neighborhood, it's like Fleer in 63. They did a major league set or they had trouble getting distribution, Victor, even though Fleer was a known bubblegum company. But they said, I've already got the Topps. It's Mari Wills. It just points out that it's complicated and tie goes to tops. And so I'm getting a little more sympathetic to the allure of a 52 tops high number, admittedly, with a great story by Cy Berger about the Hudson River and all that. But it's actually more plentiful than the 51 Bowman, in my opinion. The demand is much higher for the tops, but the Bowman is also a high number. It's potentially even more condition sensitive being off-cut and printer lines and things like that. But like I said, if it's not available in your neighborhood, when you're growing up, you're thinking, no, the 52, that's the icon of the boyhood. For most people, it's not, oh, I remember the 51 Bowman Mantle with the horizontal pose or something. Nobody says that. I hear you. I, I don't want to be the grumpy old guy that says, hey, you're all wrong. That's not the way it's supposed to be. In my book, I, I take those types of cards and I use the Mantle. I also use the Michael Jordan with the 84 star. Yeah. And the 86 Fleer, I've deemed those as asterisk RC for both of them, designating to me anyways that it's a rookie card that's debatable within the hobby. There's some debate with these two cards that you need to be aware of. I did that in 84. If you look back yeah. and see in early 85, I hedged for a few months and gathered information and got feedback. I editorialized about it. But when I heard the consensus, it was that the, the, the base cards pack pulled were the for sure rookie card in the classic uh, historical sense. And the box set cards were also rookie cards of a sort. I have been talking about this Michael Jordan card for so long. And both sides make good arguments. Neither one of them fully comply, but still, to me, the 86 Fleer is the king. But you're playing, the, the tie goes to the pack bold. Tie goes to the more right? recognized right. company. Star Company yeah. was... I track that very closely. It was really thinly distributed. There were four major distributors around the country that had huge stashes of these things. And you could right. get as many as you wanted if you paid the price and knew the right person. And so again, it's undemocratic. And that, that, there were rumors of reprintings and things like that from the very beginning. The high end boys, they'll fight me tooth and nail. I know, but they have them, Victor. And I don't yeah. think that they're hoping they maybe have had them for a long time. And they're yeah. Cards. Supply and demand is what it is. In fact, yeah, they're less of the star company. They're more condition sensitive. They're harder to find, but they weren't packed pulled and they weren't issued by a major card company, even though they were fully licensed. All you had to do is say, I'll, I'll take the Bulls. I'll take the Bulls team set. And it was five bucks or something. Yeah. And you keep it in the bag. And sometimes Jordan was on top. Each bag had a different configuration, but you knew what you were getting. But I got one of everything. Okay. And so I have that. And it's a great card. Sure. Like I say, the dealers that had them, Victor, had hundreds. I don't think they had thousands, but they had hundreds. No. But they had hundreds of all the team sets. And the Bulls probably weren't great in 84. It, it, it took them a few years oh, yeah. to really take off the chunk rookie era, where you've got so many yeah. rookies, you just don't know. You throw up your hands and you walk away. I really believe once a collector, you're always going to, but if you get too frustrated, you're going to take a break. You, you're going to walk away for a while. I do yeah. hope you come back to it because the hobby continues to evolve. But you're trying to bring some order to it and some sanity to it and some, not regulation, but just some guardrail for yeah. just what a rookie card really should be. And if it doesn't meet all these five criteria or whatever there are, then it doesn't mean it's not a rookie card in your mind, but it's universally recognized if it has all these other things. We're not saying it's the best rookie card. We're just saying this is definitely a rookie card. No one can dispute. We're not saying it's his best card. You could have a, a card that's better than the rookie card just like Jordan does now. He's got rare inserts that are better than a rookie card. To me, that's hopeful. And that might confuse some people. It's the 84, 85 star. 
There's three Jordans in those bags, not just the Bulls one. There's an Olympic and maybe it's Ricky. But of those, the, the Bulls one is the main one. That's why I'm sympathetic to the 85 tops, Mark McGuire. He hadn't hit it big, but he was a member of the Olympic team. He got a card and it's in the Olympic uniform and it was in a pack, part of the basic set. Where are you on that? I am not with the 85. I consider that a subset and I don't qualify subsets for true rookie. Okay. To me, it's 87 on those. But at the same time, out of respect for history, I'll put asterisk RC because that's another card that's debated within the hobby, whether it's the 85 or the 87. I respect both views. I have both in my collection. But what I'm trying to identify is when I draw that designation. It's a subset. What criticism or praise do you have for Comp C? Because it seems to me they're doing a lot of things right, and they're doing it programmatically. They are not studying each card. They just have some algorithmic rules that if it's the first year of a card, and they've made some mistakes because they'll misname something or, or miss something. But when they sort them in year order, and if it's the first one, it's either going to be a PRC or an RC, although I think they could give multiple years of PRC. They're doing mostly right. But like I said, when we did it, there was a lot of human oversight. And I think with Com C, it's more the human oversight is either Rich Klein or people that write in. Because it's just too mind-boggling to have so many people doing the ID department and trying to study that. You just can't. I mean, Rich knows. I know that it's most people don't know. Rich doesn't need to look it up. A lot of them I don't have to look up. I just know, hey, there's an earlier card there. My biggest contention right now is with Panini. I, I don't know what it is, what kind of loophole they have, but it seems like they just pretty much do whatever they want with that rookie card logo. It seems like they are just not following any of the licensing type things that have to be followed. And it's just like they, they just do what they want whenever they want. And I just wish I, I, I had more baseball. insight talking baseball more specifically. And even with the, their basketball draft picks products, they're, they're putting rookie card logos on that stuff. When the players are clearly not uh, in the NBA yet, they're clearly in their collegiate uniforms and they're putting RC logos on them. And I get so much questions through my DMs or my emails of, of people really confused with why that RC logo is on that product. And I, I wish I had answers for them, but uh, it's just Panini does not follow the rules all the way. I don't think cards should be unsaleable. I think everything should be saleable, but at a price that reflects the attributes of the card. And it shouldn't get a rookie card price if it's not a rookie card. Solid point. And that's definitely my long-term goal, Jim, is to write the book, gain some credibility, and, and present to these companies that option, that exact option. I would love that opportunity. Like I said, you're really going to need an executive summary because some of the leadership of the card companies are not necessarily the most serious card collectors. They package goods guys. They're super bright. Not a question of that, but the nuance that what we think is an important nuance, they think is just not a big deal to allow for the orderly progression of the hobby. You want to keep continuity with the past and you want to have an inviting future that people say, Hey, I get this. I understand. I didn't check things out. Bought from a dealer that didn't have a good reputation. I bought a set that was not fully licensed and, and I didn't know, but now I know. And I know where to go to get some insurance, some protection, that there's some yeah. bloggers, some podcasts, some, some information that's freely available. But like I said, I like the concept of a five-star unassailable. This is a legitimate rookie. And Victor, you might wind up saying that the 86 Fleer Jordan is a four-star. There is no five-star for Michael Jordan. And the star company is is three star because it wasn't pack pulled. And you, you say it's points off for that. That's a really good idea. I like that. I just think Ty goes to the one that is pack pulled to me. That's the history of the hobby. The man in the house of cards.